Hello, my name is Colleen Getty and I am with The Room to Write and this is the Journey of a Story series. Today we're sitting with David Mariello and he is a playwright of uh, the majority of his work is, is playwriting. Yeah. Uh, so welcome David. Thank you very much, glad to be here. Happy to have you. Uh, so we'll start out by uh, maybe painting a picture for the audience of looking at you writing uh, and what does that look like and sort of fill us in on what we're looking at when you're sitting and writing or standing and writing or walking and writing. Well, <clears throat> I usually write after a long period of thinking about what I want to write. I usually have a theme that I would like to get out to the audience and I develop my characters around that to bring it to life. Um, for the actual writing, um, it either comes out all at once or, well, they usually do, but then if I need to rewrite, I hate rewriting because <laughs> I've lost the spontaneity. That initial rush is what I love to do and most of the times, the play comes out pretty much 80%, 90% complete in that rush. But don't forget, I've slept on it for mm -hmm. a long time. I'll see things in a magazine that say, aha, see that goes along with what you're trying to do. So it takes a while and um, it's the type of thing that I feel I never was taught. It's just something organic that came out of me. I'll tell you a little history about that. There used to be, there still is, a, a theater company in Reading and Wakefield called the Quantum Power Players. Hmm. Are you familiar with them? Yes. They've been going many, many years. I was their president back in the 60s. I was their first two-term president. And um, I wanted to get into the quantum power plays because I heard so much about them and I wanted to act. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an actor. Oh. So these friends of mine said, come on, we'll take you. They, have a, they were long-term members of the quantum power players. And um, I just fell into it. I did a few roles on the stage. I became the president. I became the treasurer. I just, just really, you know. But what I discovered was I loved being on stage. And what I discovered was that if the play is going right, if it's a well-written play, and if the director and the actors have done it properly, you feel a power you have over that audience. Mm. You can get them to be more interested, relax a little bit, and if the play wasn't good, you could feel you're losing them. They're mm. putting up with it, but they're not really enjoying the play. So that's what got me in the idea of writing my own plays. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to stop you there because I have yeah. a couple of questions for you. Yeah. So the first thing that I'm wondering about when you're talking about your process and how you sort of, uh, you know, percolate your ideas right. and then they all come out. Uh, do you shut your phone off? I mean, how are you able to, you know, are you aware that you have an idea and you know now I'm going to sit down and I'm sh everything is off because I'm going to spend my time writing? Well, I, I lived alone. I had my own apartment in Boston. That's where I did a lot of my work. And I lived in Stoneham and had my business there, but I was able to also write mm. without interference. And But all I can say is it just spilled out. I can think of at least three of my plays that just, they kind of wrote themselves. Mm. The actors, the characters were there. They spoke what they were supposed to speak. And I said, wow, where is this coming from? Right. Yeah. And so what's the, what does the mechanics of that look like? So are you just writing things as they come rapidly. out? I'm typing okay. rapidly. First on a regular typewriter, because I fought computers for quite a while, but then on to a computer. And I'd say I'd pretty <coughs> much write the whole play in one fell swoop. So um, when you're doing your 
when everything's coming out and you're writing everything, mm -hmm. what does that look like format-wise and mechanical-wise? It's pretty wise? messy format-wise because <laughs> I don't take time to do all the stops and so forth. But then I do get around to doing that. And what I would advise a writer to do is at that stage, he should get some friends or actors and sit around a table and read the play out loud. Hmm. And that will key him to where the play works and where it doesn't. And you will know when it doesn't work as you have these people read it. Now, you may disagree with them which is fine, stick to your guns, but most of the time you're going to agree that the play is not working in this particular spot. It's very, very valuable to do. I used to do that with all my plays. In fact, there are groups that are organized just to do that. They read wow. each other's plays and then critique them, and it's very, very valuable to do that. So that sounds a lot like a critique group. Uh, but a totally different one, uh, which yeah, is really interesting. Yeah, you tell the good and the bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reading out loud, even just as a way to check your own writing, is exactly. Yeah. Amazing yeah. tool to have. Right. Uh, so I don't but, know if you but, can. But you've got to. You, I can't. I can't explain where I learned this. Mm -hmm. But a play has certain. Uni unifying elements, middle, uh, beginning, middle, end. And that's there somehow. If you've written a good play, those things are there. And then you can hang the rewrites on to the major positions. But the, the through line is there pretty much. And I read a lot of plays for Players Ring in New Hampshire. And after 10 pages, you can tell this play is going to work or it's not going to work. Now, you want to give it a little more time than that, but usually you know in the first 10 or 15 pages something is not working. So today I have a little bit of a cough, uh, but that leads to a good question since you're a playwright. Uh, what, do, what do you do as the writer of a play when what's happening up on stage uh, might not sync up exactly with what you wrote? Well, you hope that doesn't happen, but there are times when a director, you know, ha decides on his own to do something, and uh, it's really a no-no. Mm. He should get permission from the uh, author. Mm. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, I've had directors who have been very helpful to me. They'll say at the last minute, you know, Dave, this word should be this instead of that. and so they've, it can go either way. Hmm. But most of them are very courteous and they don't uh, pull any fast ones. Yeah. So when you're writing and everything's sort of coming to you, are you distinguishing like dialogue with quotes? Are you, is it just coming out in one big paragraph or how is that, pro what's that whole process? Well, I, I kind of imagine the characters talking to themselves and then I put it down on paper. And uh, the, the most important thing is you want dialogue to be alive. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to read like a novel. So you've got to find a way to make the, what they're saying very natural, yet at the same time getting them to say what you want the audience to hear. And that many times is a problem with a new play. You read it and you say, this guy is mostly writing a book than mm -hmm. a play. Um, one of the examples I use if I'm talking to someone who's just learning to write a play is imagine a novel as a football field. Your characters have the whole field to get to know each other and to interchange. They can run away from each other, they can go with each other. But in uh, playwriting, think of it as a boxing. They're in this ring mm. and almost their hands are almost tied together and they've got to socialize. And that's a lot different than having that whole wide range of narrative that you would have in the football field. So if you can hone it down to these really lively 
back and forths, the audience will really get interested in it. Mm. And so when you're thinking about um, how you, you know, you said you don't know where writing came from in your life, basically. Do right. you remember watching a play or a movie or, how, well, you know? Uh, I think what helped me, and I throw this out to anyone, I read a lot as a child. I would sit next to the stove, we were very poor, and you know, would have a wood burning stove. And I'd sit there with my cat on the lap, and I would read Bambi, not the Disney Bambi, the real novel. You know, there's a novel. No. Oh, yes, it's a famous novel <coughs> by a German writer. And um, I would read books that were maybe a little older than what I should be writing. But first of all, get some young person that you're interested in, get them to read. And get them to read adult books. I don't mean dirty adult books, but the classics, Jane Eyre, um, Pulitzer Prize winners, Gone with the Wind, um, Moby Dick. I, get them to really stretch their muscles. And then, if you can get them involved with like the theater group, um, that's another way of growing. If you're in a play, you know, you learn the path, the director coaches you, and then in front of an audience is that really pressure when that curtain goes up. But it's all a learning skill that I say is really, really very healthy. And I began writing short plays and we produced them in little coffee houses. There was a time when the north end of Boston had some nice little coffee houses and they'd allow you to, to do a play. Really? And I did that. I produced my first play in Cambridge in I think around 1983. And I you produced it yourself? Yeah. I tried to get some theater companies to do it and they said, well, we will or we won't, we will. So I finally says, I'm going to hire the theater, hire publicity men and women, hire the director, get the actors, and we did it. Wow. And it was a big hit, very big hit. And what was that called? But mostly because it's raining. Oh. A funny title, but it has a meaning because th these people meet in the middle of a rainstorm, which they never would have met if it hadn't been raining. So... Hmm. Yeah. And that was it, in Cambridge, did you say? We did it in Cambridge, and then it went on to be done in small theaters in New York, little black boxes. They sat 40 people, 50 people, and that got done maybe five or six times. Oh, wow. And I made a little bit of money. Really? Not much. That's unheard of in the writing world. I know, I know. That's true. And so I, we, we talked a little bit beforehand about this, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit more now. Um, about the reality of money and writing, and those two don't necessarily always go together. Yeah, it does go uh, together. In your life, uh, you started out with a regular day job, and now you're sort of finding your way back to writing more. Right. And I can produce my own plays now, which I couldn't have done then, although I'll never know if then a producer might have saw my work and produced it. So... I gambled, and I'm where I'm where I'm at now, and we'll see what happens. With a roof over your head, right? With, right, <laughs> a roof over my head, and able to um, produce my second movie, wow. and give these uh, talented actors a job. It doesn't pay a lot of money, but it, it's something. And um, and what are those two? Are those plays that became movies? They, they are plays that were made into a movie, but here's the distinction. Many times when someone does a play in, as a movie, they open it up. Do you know what that no. means? Okay. If in the stage play there was a car accident, they talked about it uh. on the stage. In a movie, they open it up and they show. Mm. I didn't want to do that. I said, let's make a movie, but stick it, stick very closely to what the author wrote. And I have this director who agreed with me that it can be done. And what we do is 
we produce the play in a sound stage like this, but instead of the camera just sitting out front like an audience, the camera is up on the stage with the actors and they do close-ups, they do from up above, we made it snow, we made it rain. Now the audiences know this is all on stage, but it's still very cinematic. Mm. And you've stuck to the very words of the author. So wow. this is the second one we're doing and hopefully, um, I'd like to see it become a regular business because <laughs> many plays will never see the light of day because mm. it's so expensive to do a play. And nowadays, theaters are looking for plays that have a name. Very hard to break in, so. And do you always do yours at the same theater or? Well, the first one we did cost a tremendous amount of money. And we've learned a lot since then. We hired a soundstage that was so big you could land an airplane in it. <coughs> and we had dressing rooms. We had a full-time maid who cooked for 30 people. Wow. We put the 30 people up in local hotels. Cost an arm and a leg. Mm. Now we're down to this very special camera. We're picking and choosing what we do. We have this very small, I'd say about a third of this. And uh, we're going to see how it looks. Wow. Yeah, I think it's going to look very good. The first one came out beautifully. And so is this like 12 Angry, angry Men or uh, kind those types of, of movies? Yes, absolutely. That's a good point. Hmm. Yeah. There's another one that's even more like what I'm doing. It's called Dogville. And they don't even have a set. They have lines on the floor and say, this is the dining room. This is the kitchen. And they actually go in and out, but there are no walls or anything. Hmm. So it's all left to the audience's imagination. It's a terrific. Right. Dogville. And what a great uh, sort of reversal of what the trend usually is, which is it went from writing right. and now everything is very visual. Right. And now some of these very visual artists are taking the visual and making it more up to the audience. Yeah. To fill in the blanks. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so, you know, what would you say is some of the things you learned in writing plays, in writing screenplays, and uh, things that you learned maybe on your own or from people uh, that you could sort of share with the audience? Well, I did learn a lot from these groups, these critique groups where you read each other's plays. And there are certain things you've got to be aware of, the protagonists, is the lead character, the antagonist is the enemy. You gotta have that strife, you gotta have that conflict. Mm -hmm. Usually there's gotta be something they call the inciting incident that starts the play. And that's very important. Uh, if you can get audiences really interested, like, uh, oh my God, uh, 20 horses fell over a cliff and died, and you know, you really get them going. Mm. Then maybe you can slow down later on and fill in some of the information. Okay. But you don't want to give too much of the information in a flat, stale way. You know, 20 horses died, the stable caught fire. You got to give it some life to it, the inciting incident. And so what's your advice for how do you add life to uh, your writing? Like, uh, is there any sort of t tricks you use? Or? Well, here's one trick that uh, I learned. Imagine you're writing a radio script. Hmm. Now the audience can't see the characters, so you've got to put into their expressions words. You don't say, look at you, you look so gloomy. Well, even that's a little bit of a, but it would say, look at you with your lips, like that and your eyes running and make is, makeup is coming down. You see the difference? Mm, right. That's it's very that important. That show not tell thing, right. huh? <laughs> oh, that's very important. Now I have a tendency to tell a lot and I got to watch that. And so does that get caught in those groups or do you catch that on your own at, the, at this point? Uh, mostly in the groups, you know. Yeah. And where do you find these groups and are they called critique groups or is there a special name for playwright groups? Well, there was one of the Harvard Square scriptwriters. I think that's still going on. And I'm sure you can look it up on the web. And then there's a group called Playwrights Platform. 
in Boston where they do new plays and critique each other's work. And they have a festival every year, so you have a chance of actually seeing your play done. Yeah. Now, the Players Ring in Portsmouth was formed to do new plays. So every year we have people send in their scripts, we read them, and we choose the best ones, and we actually produce them. So that's a really a great help to the new writer because he gets to learn the weaknesses of his play or the strengths of his play. Right. Yeah, we do establish plays too, but our main focus is on new scripts. Right. So that's something people can think about. There's a lot of groups like that now that are coming on. Right, and I, and you know, it sort of strikes me the uh, interesting point of. Uh, Playwriting is almost, it takes a totally different writer, maybe, that, uh, I mean, at least well, for you, you want to. Well, certainly different than a novel. Right. And certainly different than po a poem. I, I don't think I could really write a good poem, but... Um, well, and it, it, it has that short form. Yeah. But uh, even the, the fact that you were drawn to the acting part of your own play, yeah. or maybe other plays, and a lot of writers... They just want to stay behind the page. Uh, yeah, do you no. find that playwrights usually want to be in all sorts of um, parts of I their play? Don't, or? Uh, no. I, I, I've never wanted to be in one of my plays. So you don't want to be in your own play? No. Okay. Because you had mentioned you wanted to be an actor. Yeah. Uh, but that was a while ago when I first sat it out. I wanted to be an actor. And, um, but that's where I got the feeling of this power that the play can have on, on people mm -hmm. if it's done properly. It's just an amazing feeling. I mean, you, you, this gets a little spiritual, but you're connecting one to one, which is really what we are. We should all be connected one to one. But when, when you watch, uh, like an aria in an opera, when that opera singer hits that high note, you're with it. You, right. You've had that experience, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Oh, yeah. Well. I just saw a play um, the other night. It was a TV, it wasn't live, it was filmed. It was a play by, um, oh gee, I can't think of it, he was married to Marilyn Monroe, oh. the playwright. I can't, can't think of it. Anyway, it's a beautiful piece of work. And uh, you could just feel the audience was like frozen to silence because it was so perfect that they just made this connection. Right. It was really beautiful. And that's what theater is all about. And then that leads to why live theater is so important. Hmm. Any art is so important because to make a great work of art, the creator has poured so much energy into that that it's almost like the old um, uh, soothsayers who used to try to turn lead into gold, mm. and they would do that with heat and so on and so forth. Well, that's a, uh, an allegory or analogy, an allegory, I guess, because in real life, when an artist concentrates and focuses, that's the heat. And then that draws, when the audience comes to look at it, they pick that up. And it helps transform them. They think about life differently. They, they are uh, uplifted. Even if the play is sad, if it's done properly, you still have those elements of perfection in there. Mm -hmm. And in a way, art is reminding us of how perfect we are. Right, and I feel like you just touched on a really important part of what every writer wants, even if they're not a playwright. And uh, we talked about this uh, reading your work out loud, even if it's just with a few people. Yeah. And the idea of why is that so fulfilling? Uh, why do you want to read your work? And you almost want to, you want to see what do people think? Are you connecting with them? Right. And it's sort of an authentic way to connect and doing that as a playwright you're seeing that in so many different people all at the same time. Right. That can be so powerful. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it, 
just to wrap up, uh, which that was a great point to wrap up that you just made, but uh, is there anything that you sort of want, would like to leave the audience with? Uh... Go to live theater. Support your live theaters. Buy a season su subscription. Go to they many theaters offer free play readings. Mm -hmm. They just sit with the script in hand and they invite the audience to come in and then they discuss it afterwards. It's a great thing to do for audiences. It's free. Usually oh, it's free. That's a yeah. great idea. I've never I, heard I of know that. Players Ring does that. Okay. Every time we do a new play, we select one day when the audience is invited to stay and the uh, director and the actors and the writer get up on stage and get questions from the audiences. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, David, oh, for all your information. I'm sorry I had a, a few coughs in That's there. Not bad uh, but at you're all. used to the unpredictable stage. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and uh, anybody else who would like to join us in the Room to Write uh, the, with the Journey of the Story series, please visit us at uh, theroomtowrite.org. Thanks Great. again. You're welcome. My pleasure.